besides um, purely economic factors, um, such as division of labor, um, money, and capital accumulation, um, of course, ideological factors, ideological components uh, play also uh, a very important role um, in economic development and in the formation of societies. These ideological factors, in a way, even influence such fundamental things as uh, the attitude towards division of labor uh, that exists in societies, and in particular also um, the attitude towards uh, capital accumulation, uh, the desire to become wealthier or to uh, be satisfied with uh, low standards of living. Um, and I want to spend this, uh, this lecture um, just um, uh, discussing some ideological factors, mostly uh, religious factors influencing uh, economic development. Um, let me um, start, for instance, by uh, reminding you that um, capital accumulation and based on capital accu accumulation also the desire to make inventions, uh, technological improvements and so forth um, uh, can be encouraged or can be discouraged by certain uh, prevalent ideologies existing um, in society. Um, let me just give you, uh, before I um, start talking about major religions, um, just uh, give you some examples that, that makes this intuitively clear. Um, imagine, for instance, people would believe in a deity that uh, leaves uh, the world with the instruction uh, that things should be left the way they are. Um, uh, if such a religion would be, so to speak, a powerful religion among <coughs> people, you can easily imagine that such a society does not have much of a potential uh, to develop and become prosperous, we would likely guess that societies such as this will tend to die out, will be taken over actually by uh, other societies. Um, or imagine uh, a so society that has a very deep and profound uh, ancestor worship. Um, of such a society, we would expect um, that it will display to a large extent uh, very ritualistic type behavior and also will be um, yeah, reluctant to <coughs> introduce inno any, uh, any innovations. Um, uh, the same is also true for uh, slave societies, and of course for uh, many parts of the world uh, and for large parts of human history, uh, we did have uh, slave societies. Um, uh, the most prominent examples of both being classical civilization, Greek Roman civilization, and then of course also uh, the example of um, of the United States. Um, in slave societies, it is frequently the case that uh, uh, the slaves do the work, so to speak, and uh, the masters uh, lays around, uh, don't do much, are not involved in the day-to-day -day activities, <coughs> and because they are not involved in the day-to-day -day activities, 
they also contribute little to improvements in the technology that uh, can be employed in these day-to-day -day, um, activities. Um, let me give you a brief quote from uh, Carol Quigley to this effect. Uh, he writes, uh, suppose that a primitive tribe believes, believes that its social organization was established by a deity who went away leaving strict instructions that nothing be changed. Such a society would invent very little. Egyptian civilization was something like that. Um, or any society that had ancestor worship would probably be, have weak incentives to invent. Or a society whose productive system was based on slavery would probably be uninventive. Slave societies such as classical civilization or the southern states of the United States in the period before 1860 have been notoriously uninventive. No major inventions uh, in the field of production came from either of these civilizations. This is not to say that these civilizations did not develop other achievements. Obviously, uh, the Greek civilization um, allowed an, a class of <coughs> philosophers to emerge, and they passed another form of an inheritance to us, that is, that of rigorous logical thinking, which also uh, has, of course, a, a tremendous uh, impact on human development, but when it comes to improving existing tools that one use in production, uh, they have indeed been very unproductive, so to speak. Um, uh, let me give a few other examples uh, that would show how um, certain ideologies might prevent that uh, wealth is accumulated in societies. Um, there exist uh, religions, for instance, that prescribe that whenever the master of a household dies, that he should be buried with all of his possessions. Um, that seems to be, from the outset, a very stupid attitude as far, at least as far as ever making any progress uh, is concerned, every generation would, so to speak, ruin whatever they have accumulated uh, during, uh, during a generation. Um, or uh, imagine societies that are ridden by feelings of envy. Um, there exist numerous examples of that that you can find, for instance, in uh, that famous book by Helmut Schoek, a German sociologist, on envy. And you also find many examples mentioned, many of them taken from the Schoek book in uh, Rosbart's uh, little book on uh, egalitarianism as a revolt against nature. And again, I just want to um, quote one example of a society such as this uh, from Herbert Spencer. Um, Spencer writes, there exist reports about the chiefs among the Abbey ponies uh, in the Dakotas that have nothing either in his arms or his clothes to distinguish him from a common man except the peculiar oldness and shabbiness of them. For if he appears in the streets with a new and handsome apparel, the first person he meets will boldly cry, give me that dress, and unless he immediately parts with it, he becomes the scoff and scorn of all and hears himself called covetous. Uh, Obviously, a society like this is also not suitable uh, to accumulate much in terms of, uh, much in terms of uh, wealth. 
uh, or there exist societies that as soon as the big chief has accumulated a certain amount of foodstuff or so, uh, he is obliged to throw a big party for the entire tribe mm -hmm. and then in the big party all of the resources that have been accumulated will be wasted away. That is, a continuous process of capital accumulation simply does not take place in societies such as this. Now it can be safely assumed that uh, these types of examples that I gave uh, are obviously not examples of societies that we would expect to, yeah, to stand the test of times, uh, to, uh, to, last, to last very long but instead being displaced by other societies uh, that have different, different attitudes and yeah, either defeat them in, uh, uh, in the form of warfare or simply displace them. That is just uh, make them, uh, push them out of the territories that they inhabit to ever more uninhabitable uh, territories and then ultimately die out, so to speak. Um, what I now want to do is um, undertake a, um, a survey of the major uh, religions and their attitudes uh, towards work uh, and uh, invention and uh, capital accumulation. I'm not interested in the pure theological part of these religions, just in those parts of the religions um, that have, so to speak, repercussions for the day-to-day -day conduct that people are expected to uh, engage in. And um, um, let me begin um, with one of the religions that is uh, comparatively uh, bad when it comes to capital accumulation, inventiveness, uh, and so forth, that is uh, Hinduism. Um, uh, Hinduism is uh, characterized uh, as far as its uh, economic doctrines are concerned, first by uh, uh, explicit taboos of using certain resources. Um, as you all know, for instance, uh, cows cannot be used. Uh, and there exist other taboos that simply make it impossible that resources that could be put to some uh, to some useful employment uh, are, based on religion, excluded as something that mankind should uh, take advantage of. Um, in addition, uh, Hinduism is a religion that is characterized by some strict association taboos, that is to say, uh, certain groups of people uh, are not allowed to associate with certain other types um, of people and you immediately <laughs> recognize that this is of course some sort of uh, obstacle when it comes to the development of uh, division, uh, division of labor. Um, what you would expect of such a society that is a society of castes um, that uh, are prevented from having any uh, systematic contact uh, with each other um, is uh, that there is some sort of uh, petrification of production modes. Um, each caste sticks to its own techniques and tasks that are assigned to it. Um, and there is no uh, interchange of ideas, there is no social mobility uh, of any kind. And this obviously, again, uh, has 
negative repercussions as far as that economic growth potential um, is concerned. Um, in addition, Hinduism um, uh, requires uh, strict obedience uh, to the rules of, uh, uh, of the caste and uh, has, so to speak, uh, severe obstacles in the way of any economic programs, uh, progress placed in itself. Um, there is the promise of, uh, of a reincarnation into, um, into higher classes, um, which, uh, uh, yeah, which leads the lower classes uh, to uh, not rebel against the existing caste system because a rebellion against the existing caste system will precisely prevent that in a future life they will be reincarnated into a higher, um, uh, into a higher uh, caste. There is also, uh, this has to do with this uh, uh, taboo with respect to certain objects, uh, uh, there is also the problem that there is no clear-cut uh, distinction, so to speak, in, uh, in the rank of creatures on Earth. Um, recall, for instance, in Christianity, um, in Genesis, uh, we learn that mankind is, so to speak, the highest of all creatures and has dominion over the rest of the world. Um, on the other hand, if you have a religion uh, that does not necessarily see mankind as the highest development having dominion over the animals, but that there are, so to speak, gradual differences between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom, um, uh, then again, this is something that hampers uh, the economic uh, growth, pro uh, uh, growth pot potential. It leads also to uh, widespread vegetarianism. Uh, and widespread vegetarianism, uh, despite uh, the fact that there are uh, some people who propagate that even in our societies, uh, I don't think it is a uh, a healthy lifestyle, uh, certainly not a lifestyle that energizes you uh, and makes you an entrepreneurial uh, person if you only just eat these corns and whatever these people <laughs> eat there. <coughs> um, uh, Hinduism also permits uh, human, <coughs> human sacrifices. Uh, which again indicates, so to speak, that the status of humans is not above everybody else. Um, and uh, it encourages orgies, um, that is activities that display, so to speak, a uh, high degree of time preference, having fun right now, just overdoing it completely, uh, not disciplining yourself during these orgiastic experiences um, that you go through. Um, on the other hand, they also uh, emphasize pomp, um, that is uh, the display of riches. Uh, and do not do what we will see later on, uh, especially puritanical religions do. That is, uh, you don't live a pompous life. Uh, you are humble um, and uh, invest, but don't show to everyone how well off uh, you are. Uh, and in general, it is a religion that encourages submission. 
submission of certain groups vis-a-vis uh, -vis other groups. Um, so if we rank various religions, um, we can say from the outset that Hinduism is not exactly a religion that promises as long as people really adhere to it. Um, that promise has uh, great economic promises in store. Um, and in a way, looking at India, uh, we can see that that is somehow borne out by the facts. Uh, in addition, of course, India has also uh, adopted another stupid system that is mass democracy, um, which contributes to that in addition. But this is, so to speak, a modern, modern development. Uh, traditional India, of course, was not, uh, not uh, democratic by any means. Um, let's then take uh, another Eastern uh, religion, Buddhism. And uh, to a lesser extent, what applies to Buddhism also applies to Taoism. Um, Buddhism started in a way as uh, a reform movement of Hinduism, but uh, disappeared essentially from India and uh, gained influence in Southeast Asia outside of the uh, Indian subcontinent. Um, the view of, of the Buddhists of life is um, that the ultimate wisdom consists in uh, detach, detachment from, uh, from life, from the earth, earthly, worldly uh, life. It views life as, uh, as painful, um, and it considers the, um, uh, an ascetic, ascetic life, lifestyle as a means to, uh, to eliminate or to reduce the pain uh, that comes from regular life. So it advocates a life of ascetic meditation. Um, again, it should be perfectly clear that this is not encouraging, so to speak, uh, the type of attitude that we consider to be uh, normal and characteristic for uh, people to withdraw from the world. Um, the goal of the Buddhist religion um, is, uh, is nirvana. And nirvana uh, is a state of affairs that brings, so to speak, about the elimination of all desires. Now, of course, if you try to eliminate all your human desires, uh, then there will be little need to engage in productive activities, which are those activities that we consider to be necessary in order to uh, reduce our, uh, our pains. Um, the essence and purpose of life for the Buddhist and also for the Taoist in this to a certain extent um, is not individual fulfillment uh, and especially not individual fulfillment in this life. Um, it is um, the life that anyone lives right now is just one of thousands of lives. Um, so very little emphasis is in, in personal happiness, in individual uh, achievement. Um, Taoism uh, teaches uh, the serene acceptance and humility and 
gentleness and passivity uh, and understanding acceptance of whatever happens to occur rather than individual accomplishment and individual advancement. Let me come to the next next major religion. Uh, again, so Buddhism, and again, uh, the empirical evidence bears that clearly out, that uh, uh, devoted Buddhist societies are, in fact, not exactly highly developed societies. Um, as the next one, let's take Islam. Um, Islam also does not encourage in any way individual autonomy. As a matter of fact, the translation of Islam is submission. Um, and what we frequently hear from uh, proponents of Islam, that they point out this golden age of Islam during the time that they uh, occupied Spain and rescued some of the uh, achievements that were um, generated by the classical Greek culture uh, and uh, transmitted them, so to speak, to uh, Christianity. Um, uh, this so-called golden age is more of an exception, a fluke in Islam than typical uh, of the Islamic religion. Um, the main proponents during this era of the main intellectuals of this era, the main Islamic intellectuals were by and large intellectuals that had broken with orthodox uh, Islam and were considered to be were, uh, regarded with utmost suspicion um, by um, the Islamic uh, community at their time. So it was only by breaking away from orthodox uh, Islamic beliefs that these sorts of achievements uh, became, uh, became possible. Um, the Islamic religion is very f familistic, that is family uh, oriented and uh, very hierarchical, uh, hierarchically structured, rigidly hierarchically structured, um, not unlike the Chinese societies to which I will come um, in, a little, in a little bit. Um, again, the structure, the hierarchical structure you can see in particular in the relationships between men and, uh, men and females. Uh, females are clearly uh, uh, members of societies with significantly less uh, rights than, uh, than men have. Um, in Islam, um, science and reason uh, are not recognized as in Christianity, so to speak, as a gift of God. Um, they are not regarded as valuable in and of itself, um, as they are, for instance, in, in Thomism, uh, that is in uh, certain branches of uh, uh, Christianity. Um, Islam rather views life on earth um, as something that has no inherent or internal purpose 
but it is mostly a preparation for the eternal life that comes afterwards. In this, in this regard, Islam is not all that different from very early Christianity, which also had similar attitude that life on earth uh, was of relatively minor importance and the main goal of it was just for the preparation for uh, life, after, life after death. This is of course not characteristic for later Christianity, but in the early stages of Christianity, this sort of attitude did prevail um, also. Um, in the view of uh, Islam, uh, God, uh, after the creation of the world, uh, does not really retreat. Um, the Christian view is God creates a world and then, and then he lets things happen, so to speak. Then mankind is on their own. Uh, they have to prove themselves. But from the point of view of Islam, um, God remains continuously involved um, in worldly affairs. Uh, but if God remains continuously involved in, in earthly affairs, this then makes also the study and the seek, the, the search for universal and eternal laws, uh, some sort of sinful behavior, almost blasphemous. Um, right? If you think that God retreats and then lets the world run the way he has organized it, then of course it makes sense to try to figure out what the laws of the world are. But if God remains involved in earthly affairs, then in a way it doesn't make any sense to even look out for universal regularities. Uh, as a matter of fact, to stipulate that there are universal regularities is some sort of insult against the belief that God remains continuously involved um, in earthly affairs. So this is considered to be somewhat uh, a vain, uh, vain activity uh, and denying almost God's almightiness. Um, again, what should be perfectly clear from the outset is that if this is and to the extent that <coughs> these beliefs are, so to speak, the beliefs of uh, the overwhelming majority of the people uh, that you should expect uh, little in terms of uh, scientific uh, and scholarly achievement uh, coming from these societies and the achievements coming from these societies as I mentioned uh, are mostly uh, produced by individuals who have somehow broken with the basic tenets of um, um, of the religion. Uh, let me um, uh, quote on this subject um, a, a German anthropologist who writes on, on this um, feature of Islam. Um, his name is von, von Grünebaum. And he says, Islam was never able to accept that scientific research is a means of glorifying God. Those accomplishments of Islamic mathematical and medical science, which continue to compel our admiration, were developed in areas and in periods where the elites were willing to go beyond and possibly against the basic strains of orthodox thought and feeling. For the sciences never did shed the suspicion of bordering on the impious. This is why the pursuit of the natural sciences as that of philosophy tended to become located in relatively small and esoteric circles and why but few of their representatives 
would escape an occasional uneasiness which not infrequently did result in some kind of apology for their own work. Now after Islam, also not exactly favorable to economic uh, development, and again something that is borne out by, um, by the fact, uh, we come now to uh, Confucianism. Uh, and uh, Confucianism, we have to admit from the outset, is far more suitable for economic growth, has a far more positive attitude uh, toward uh, science and investigation, um, and is in a way a very interesting, uh, very interesting case. Uh, keep in mind that until 1500 or so, China was clearly the most developed uh, region on, um, on the globe. Um, uh, Confucianism is entirely realistic in its outlook and entirely this-worldly. Um, it has no anthropomorphic concept of a god. It does speak of heavens, but the heavens are some sort of uh, impersonal thing. This is, has nothing to do with what we Im imagine God to be, which has, of course, some sort of mm, yeah, uh, manly uh, image. Um, they actually do not have a concept of a, um, of a deity. Um, they also have no promise of an afterlife. Um, that can be an advantage, uh, that can be a disadvantage. Um, that depends in a way on uh, how other religions depict the afterlife. Uh, but in any case, uh, no promise of an afterlife is given. The entirely realistic and rationalistic attitude of Confucianism is also reflected in the fact that uh, there exist no miracles for them. In contrast to Christianity where we admit the existence of uh, miraculous events, miraculous events do not exist for Confucians. Um, that is, everything can be rationally explained. Um, and accordingly, there also exists no such thing as uh, saints. Um, <coughs> Confucius himself is neither a god, um, nor is he a prophet. Um, Confucius is just uh, a leader, a teacher. Um, because of this, some people have even doubted whether it is appropriate to refer to Confucianism as a religion. Um, uh, that is, without, without a god, without a prophet, uh, can we legitimately refer to it um, uh, as a religion? Um, let me, at this, this moment, uh, give you a quote from uh, Stanislav Andreski uh, on Confucianism. Uh, Stanislav Andreski is a Polish sociologist who taught most of his life in England and is one of those very few sociologists that are not lefties. Um, there are a few others, uh, Robert Nisbet and Helmut Schoek, uh, and, uh, and uh, as I said, Stanislav Andreski, a very interesting author. Um, he writes on Confucianism, 
if we want to rank the religions in accordance with their compatibility with the findings of science, we must place Confucianism far ahead in the first place. Indeed, its rationalistic and this-worldly outlook has led some scholars to deny that it is a religion. Nonetheless, it certainly is a religion in the etymological sense which is derived from the Latin word to bind because it undoubtedly did constitute a bond which united many millions during two millennia. However, if we include an anthropomorphic concept of deity and a promise of life after death as essential characteristics of religion, then we have to conclude that Confucianism was not a religion because, Conf uh, because to the Confucians the supreme entity is heavens, an invisible and impersonal force rather than a personalized God modeled on the image of a terrestrial despot as in the religions born in the Near East. When asked about what happens after death, Confucius replied, when you don't know enough about the living, how can you know about the dead? He never claimed nor was attributed posthumously by his followers any powers which could be called supernatural or magical. The Confucians expect no miracles, have no saints, and revere their founder not as a deity, but as a great teacher. So we can say that uh, Confucianism is certainly uh, a world outlook that is clearly compatible with capitalism. Um, it has a very strong emphasis on, um, on filial piety, on uh, family solidarity. Um, and that might have some sort of negative effect when it comes to um, individual inventiveness, uh, breaking out of existing traditions um, uh, and so forth. But in principle, of course, uh, filial piety and uh, familialism is nothing that is uh, incompatible with, um, um, uh, with capitalism. Um, again, let me, as regards this uh, lack of innovative spirit that you can find among uh, the Confucians, um, give you a quote from, um, from Charles Murray. Um, out of his book In Pursuit of Excellence, which I think captures this idea quite well. He says, at the core of the Confucian ethic was the quality called Ren, the supreme virtue in men, a quality that combines elements of goodness, benevolence, and love. This ethic was most essential for those with the most power. He who is magnanimous wins the multitude, Confucius taught. He who is diligent attains his objective. And he who is kind can get service from the people. Indeed, to be a gentleman, which is another concept in Confucian thought, required one above all to embody this uh, characteristic of Ren. Um, and lest one think that a gentleman could get by with mousing the proper platitudes, Confucius added the gentleman first practices what he preaches and then preaches uh, what he practices. Um, now, Chinese and uh, Japanese children also to a certain extent uh, 
are then, because of this familial, uh, strong family orientation, uh, are supposed to make their life decisions always mindful of first the wishes and the welfare of their parents, then of their extended family, and then also of the, uh, of the community. And there is uh, a lack of encouragement that can be found uh, of uh, achieving one's own uh, fulfillment uh, no matter what. Uh, something that you do find to a far larger extent, of course, um, in, uh, in the Western uh, tradition. Um, in addition, while there is um, great emphasis on learning um, among, uh, among the Chinese, um, and while China is, so to speak, a meritorious system. That is where people from all walks of life, from all ranks, can, through some sort of examination system, reach the highest uh, levels of, uh, uh, of society. Um, that is a society that, in a way, selects for high IQs um, and thereby also tends to bind the population uh, to, to the earthly powers. Um, that is because everyone can rise and there is a meritocratic meritocr 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 system uh, that uh, makes it appear fair who rises and who doesn't rise, so that even the lower strata of society are somehow consoled uh, to live with, uh, live with this system. Um, but um, what must be said as one of the explanations why China nonetheless did not, uh, was not able to compete ultimately uh, with the West um, was its uh, connection that existed between Confucianism and uh, the state bureaucracies from very early on. Um, that is, you did have, which we will see we don't have in the West, um, and immediate or a more or less direct identity between uh, the earthly rulers, the uh, Chinese emperor, uh, and uh, the top hierarchies uh, of the Confucian uh, 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 doctrine of the Confucian uh, theology for lack of a uh, of a better word. So Confucianism had tied its forces very early on, very closely uh, to the state. And because of that, uh, the inherent uh, reluctance uh, to invent and to innovate uh, was further was further strengthened. Um, again, let me um, also point out this. Uh, this, uh, this combination of Confucianism with the state uh, led to a certain amount of uncritical thinking. That is what we know in the West and what we have learned in the West in particular from the Greeks uh, to present an argument and then a counter argument and another counter argument and try to hammer out, so to speak, what is right and what is wrong, try to refute each other in an endless game of back and forth. Uh, this is something that you rarely find uh, among the Chinese. I must say, based on my personal experience, 
because we have lots of Oriental students in uh, in Nevada, um, I can even detect that among my students up to this day, uh, whenever it comes to uh, writing critical essays, they are always extremely good when they do mathematical equations and multiple choice, they remember everything, they always rank on top of the, the class. But when it comes to writing pieces like we learned it in school, you have a thesis and then you have to uh, present the counter arguments and then you have to filter out what arguments are stronger and which ones are weaker and possibly synthesize this sort of stuff in, uh, in some way, they do show a significant weakness in this, uh, in this department. Um, another indicator for this, again this is a little bit speculative, another indicator for this is for instance while you do find a massive overrepresentation of uh, orientals in fields like mathematics, physics, um, engineering and so forth, uh, they are significantly underrepresented in law schools. Um, and in law schools it is precisely where this sort of yeah, uh, Greek style arguing uh, that we all in the West have learned from, from elementary school on, or at least we're supposed to learn from elementary school on. Um, <laughs> Uh, but where this is uh, in particular high demand in, in precisely that field, um, they are underrepresented as compared with other fields where they are clearly overrepresented. Again, a brief quote from uh, Charles Murray on on this uh, on this observation. He says. Uh, about East Asia. In the sciences, the disapproval of open dispute took a toll on the ability of East Asian science to build an edifice of cumulative knowledge. Um, the history of Chinese science is episodic, with the occasional brilliant scholarly discovery, but then no follow-up. Progress in science in the West has been fostered by enthusiastic, non-stop, competitive argument in which the goal is to come out on top. East Asia did not have the cultural wherewithal to support enthusiastic, non-stop, competitive arguments. Even in today's Japan, a century and a half after the nation began westernizing, it is commonly observed that Japan's technological feats far outweigh its slender body of original discoveries. One ready explanation for this discrepancy is the difference between progress that can be made consensually and hierarchically versus progress that requires individuals who insist that they alone are right. Um, so, so much about and of course, you can, uh, you can tell that in the West there are plenty of people who think that <laughs> they are right. <laughs> uh, nobody else is right. Um, yeah. um, so from uh, uh, Confucianism, uh, let, me, let me go to, to Judaism. Um, now from the outset, we will have to say that uh, Judaism was always a very small and in addition a dispersed group of people um, and as such had in a way very little influence on the modern world. Uh, in addition because they are a non-proselytic religion. That is they do not try to uh, go on missions and uh, convince other people to convert to their religion. So they always remained small and as a small group dispersed over many places uh, with relatively limited influence. There are some people, a German socialist uh, Zombard, uh, one of the opponents of uh, Ludwig von Mises, one of the so-called uh, Katheda socialists, 
uh, who advanced the thesis that uh, that the, the Jews were the inventors, so to speak, of modern uh, capitalism. Um, but this thesis is clearly false um, for the following reason. Y yes, it is true, for instance, that um, Holland, uh, Venice, and a city like Frankfurt flourished after the influx of Jews into these uh, places. Um, and it is also true that after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, uh, Spain declined. Um, now, but this obviously does not show any causal relationship. Um, they are also contrary examples. For instance, in Britain, uh, capitalism, industrial capitalism, uh, arose precisely during the period uh, after the Jews were expelled from England and before they were readmitted to England, which shows, so to speak, that uh, their presence was by no means necessary in order to uh, develop uh, capitalist um, institutions. And there are other indicators that go in a different direction. For instance, wherever you had large numbers of uh, Jews in the population, that is, wherever Jews were not a teeny tiny minority surrounded by a different culture, um, as was the case, for instance, in Eastern Europe, um, uh, there the economic development was always uh, negative. That is, there the Jewish present went hand in hand with abject poverty. Um, uh, and the Jews were more numerous in the backward countries, Poland, Russia, and so forth, uh, than they were in the advanced uh, countries, Germany, France, um, England, and so forth. Um, when they begin to make major contributions to science, which is, of course, nobody doubts this, um, this starts only, this begins only, uh, uh, or takes place only when there are small minorities in contact with dominant cultures surrounding them. For instance, in uh, the Middle East, in, in Spain, during the so-called golden age of the uh, Arab rule, <coughs> and in particular, after the emancipation of the Jews uh, by the Christians from the late 18th century on. I should em emphasize that the emancipation of the Jews is a Christian achievement. Um, the Jews were emancipated from their own rule, and I have to say something about that in a second, uh, not by themselves, uh, but by external forces, by Christians uh, not longer being willing, so to speak, to, to oppress them and treat them in the way that they were treated by their own. Um, so before 1800, you see comparatively in terms of little of achievements coming from Jews, and the achievement that you do see are typically people who had broken with their religion. Um, traditional Orthodox Judaism requires, again, a rigid subordination to your family and to your community. N not, not quite unlike you find it in uh, Islamic societies. And in the so-called ghettos, um, there existed self-administration of the Jews. And this self-administration was frequently, typically, given to them um, by the outside ruler uh, 
in exchange for uh, paying the outside ruler a part of the fines that the rabbis imposed internally on their own community. The Jews lived in ghettos, by the way, had something to do with the fact that some of their taboos involved that they have to live very close to the synagogue and cannot walk during certain uh, uh, periods of the day. So they have to be in, in close proximity to certain places. They cannot live widely dispersed from, from each other, at least if you are an Orthodox, uh, Orthodox Jew. Um, in Spain, for instance, that was precisely the arrangement. Um, you get self-administration in your ghetto. Uh, you can impose any type of fine, any type of punishment uh, that a rabbinical law allows to be imposed on uh, other Jews. But a certain percentage of that you have to give to the Spanish, uh, to the Spanish king. So a mutually beneficial arrangement was found uh, established between the Spanish ruler on the one hand and uh, the rabbis being in charge of, um, of the Jewish um, ghettos. Um, now, the life in the ghettos then was uh, almost completely under rabbinical control. Um, not unlike the control that uh, Islamic ayatoll ayatollahs exercise over their population. Um, to make money uh, was permitted, uh, to make money outside of the ghettos was permitted, uh, but only in order to support Talm Talmudic uh, studies. Um, and in order to do so, um, the Jews became the tools of the rulers uh, frequently in the suppression of the endogenous uh, population. That was in particular the case in places like Poland and uh, Russia. Um, that is, uh, where the uh, Jews working outside of the ghetto were used by the rulers in o as uh, tax collectors and so forth for vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the, the Polish and uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russian population. Um, the Jews were permitted to do this because Max Weber refers to them as having a double ethic. That is, they had uh, different rules that apply to them internally from rules that apply to them externally. To give you just one example, for instance, while the Christians for a long time outlawed the taking of interest, uh, the Jews also outlawed taking interest except from Christians. Um, so it was permitted, was not permitted to take interest from other Jews, but it was permitted uh, to take interest from Christians, which of course made them particularly suitable uh, for certain types of profession like money lenders um, and so forth. Um, in the ghettos, um, I'll give you some quotes on that in a second, um, the reading of books in modern languages was completely outlawed. Um, there was no writing in, even in Hebrew allowed unless it was permitted by the rabbis. Um, we are nowadays used to the fact that Jews are particularly humorous people. Uh, just think of Woody Allen and think of Murray Rothbard. Um, but humor was something that was considered to be a taboo in, uh, in the ghettos. There were rigorous enforcement of eating and sexual taboos. Uh, education concerned exclusively the Talmud and mystic writings. No mass was taught, no science, no history, no geography, uh, and all violations were severely punished, including uh, flogging to death. Um, and as I said, the liberation of the Jews 
from which point on we see then that dramatic achievements that they were capable of doing uh, was essentially a Christian achievement um, and uh, due to the attachment of yeah, uh, the puritanical values of the Old Testament which was also part of the tradition of, uh, of Judaism as soon as they were emancipated, combine that with their puritanical attitude that they had, um, they then became indeed uh, enormously successful businessmen, as successful as uh, as any uh, as any other uh, as any other group. Um, as I said, I want to read you a, a little quote on on this um, uh, atmosphere in, uh, in the Jewish ghettos. Um, before emancipation, there was no Jewish humor. Humor was taboo like in Sparta. Nor was there learning, except for purely religious learning, which was itself in a debased and degenerate state. The Jews of Europe and to a lesser extent in Muslim countries were dominated by a supreme contempt and hate for all learning except the Talmud and mysticism. Large parts of the Old Testament, all non-liturgical -lit Hebrew poetry, most books on Jewish philosophy were not read and their names were often anathem anathematized. Study of all languages was strictly forbidden as was the study of mathematics and science. Geography, history, even Jewish history were completely unknown. Nothing was so forbidden, feared, and therefore persecuted as the most modest innovation or the most innocent criticism. It was a world sunk in the most abject superstition, fanaticism, and ignorance, a world in which the preface to the first work on geography in Hebrew, published 1803 in Russia, could complain that very many great rabbis were denying the existence of the American continent and saying that it's impossible to exist. Um, so the Jewish contribution begins after the emancipation of the Jews basically from, uh, from outside and before they do not play a dominant role uh, in the development of capitalism can actually be regarded as some sort of hampering uh, the development. Um, now I come to uh, Christianity. Today I have to have a little bit more than I <laughs> had in other, other days. Um, so while Western uh, civilization uh, eventually came to surpass all other civilizations, um, one has to admit that this was uh, nothing that was obvious from the very beginning. Um, I mean, early Christianity was not individualistic, but it was absorbed in, in the collective community uh, to which a person was rigidly subordinated. Uh, again, not quite unlike uh, Islam and uh, earthly life uh, was considered to be uh, as a mere preparation for, um, for the afterlife. Um, and during the first millennium of, um, of influence exercised by, um, by Christianity, uh, one must admit that Christianity presided over a regression in, in scientific knowledge and the division of, uh, uh, division of labor. Uh, again, recall, we saw that yesterday in, when we looked at population figures uh, from 200, 300 after Christ to until about 1,000, uh, there is actually retrogression taking place. Population does not increase at all, uh, and nothing in terms of uh, scientific, scholarly, uh, technological achievements is uh, uh, accomplished during this uh, period. So what we have to say is that what we describe as a Western Christian outlook uh, developed only gradually 
especially through the incorporation of uh, Greek Aristotelian ideas, uh, culminating then in, in Thomas Aquinas. Um, and with Aquinas, so to speak, uh, the modern uh, Christian view uh, developed. And let me now describe this modern Christian, um, uh, Christian view that uh, turned out to be obviously quite successful uh, in terms of the contributions that they made to science and economic development and so forth. Um, in this modern Christian worldview, uh, the world is viewed basically as good, um, and the greatest good uh, lies in the future. The material and uh, the spiritual world are uh, seen as a unity. Uh, recall in Buddhism, for instance, it is somehow uh, the attempt made that the spiritual life uh, separates itself from, from the flesh, so to speak. Um, in Christianity, uh, spirit and body form a unity and the salvation also involves both the body and the soul. There exists no soul without, uh, without a body. And only by the performance of bodily actions um, can the soul be saved. Um, men, as I mentioned before, in the Christian worldview, uh, men is considered to be the high point of the creation. Uh, men is given dominion over the world. Um, it is clearly separated and ranks above the animal kingdom. Um, uh, for Christians, there exists no such thing as the golden age that is in the past. Uh, quite to the contrary, uh, progress is possible and uh, the future uh, holds uh, promises for Christians. Um, the world and the truth uh, is all in all knowable. Uh, we call God withdraws and we can discover uh, the eternal laws. Uh, wisdom comes as a consequence of efforts. It is not automatically there, but requires achievements and efforts on the part of men. And it takes time to develop. Um, the social world is uh, hierarchical to a certain extent. Um, there exist God and then the Pope and then the Cardinals and the Bishops and the Priests. And in the earthly realm there exists the King, the Lord, the Father, the Mother and the Kid. There is no uh, ridiculous equality. Uh, the Christian Church is anti-democratic at least the Catholic Church is anti-democratic. Um, and, um, uh, but it is also individualistic in the sense <coughs> that everyone is created by God and everyone is capable of salvation. Um, which uh, attitude, which outlook of course, is mainly responsible for the fact that it was only in Christianity that one gradually uh, got rid of an institution such as slavery. Initially, of course, in old Christianity, of course, slavery existed too. And uh, there's no, there's no clear-cut prohibition against it. Um, but, uh, based on this view that everybody is a, uh, a creature of, uh, of God and capable of salvation, uh, 
and of the attitude that Christians were a missionary religion trying to convert people, uh, gradually the view became the dominant view that slavery is incompatible with Christian attitudes. It was not by accident, so to speak, the Span some Spanish priests uh, who, uh, after the occupation and conquest of uh, uh, South America, um, were responsible for, not, Im not with immediate success, obvious, but over the time, with some success, to, um, uh, to give rise to the opinion that the Indians, after all, are also human, uh, human, human beings and not uh, wild creatures that, could be, that would be automatic uh, objects of, uh, of enslavement. Um, in addition, Christianity is, uh, is social and cooperative uh, and views the progress that is possible as the result of, of a cooperative effort. Um, so it is cooperation between people uh, that brings us closer to uh, closer to the truth. Um, let me just make one remark about Catholicism and then I uh, come to a comparison between Protestantism and Catholicism. Um, there is of course one strand in, in Christianity that has to be regarded with some sort of suspicion when it comes to uh, how suitable is it to allow the development of uh, capitalism and capital accumulation and so forth. It would be uh, the extreme uh, Paulist view um, that one should love everyone like one loves oneself instead of taking the view that one should love one's neighbor uh, as one loves oneself. Uh, it is possible to love your neighbor, um, but uh, if your neighbors encompass, so to speak, the entire world, uh, and you are supposed to be charitable to the entire world, then this would obviously be a main obstacle uh, in the way of uh, capital accumulation. But nonetheless, this is not, not the mainstream view as far as I understand it. Um, now to the f famous thesis of Max Weber. You are all familiar with this. Um, Max Weber, of course, explains the rise of capitalism um, with the development of puritanical uh, religions. Um, and um, as we will see, there is some basic truth in this, uh, in this thesis with some reservations. Um, now, capitalism, as we know it, was of course born in Italy. And Italy is Catholic. So that clearly shows that Catholicism is definitely compatible uh, with, uh, with capitalism. And in fact, the Roman Church um, was a major banking institution that is represented itself, so to speak, a capitalist uh, institution. Um, and the first big centers of capitalism were Florence and Venice, again, Catholic, Catholic places. Um, uh, and one can say, in addition, that as a matter of theology, um, Catholicism is, of course, far more en enthusiastic about human existence and human autonomy uh, and uh, human reason and human intellect than, let's say, Lutheranism and Calvinism is. 
um, Lutheranism and Calvinism uh, are, so to speak, anti-intellectual doctrines to a certain extent. Um, for the Thomist, faith and intellect can somehow be reconciled and combined. Um, for Lutherans and Calvinists, there exists a, a strict separation between, between the two, and they emphasize far more the importance of faith, of blind faith, um, than they do emphasize um, reason. Um, on the other hand, in the Catholic religion, you have, of course, a greater emphasis on, on the enjoyment of life, and you have a certain, relatively speaking, a certain disdain of, uh, of material things. Um, that would, relating to the previous lecture, that would indicate that Catholics tend to have a slightly higher degree of time preference. Um, and again, in looking at the present world, you can somehow see that that is true. Um, I mean, Dolce Vita is something that is typical of, uh, of southern countries, of Italy and Spain and so forth. Uh, Dolce Vita uh, in, in Germany in, in the 19th century was more or less unheard of. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we all live in some sort of secular age, uh, so the Germans also do Dolce Vita uh, plenty in the meantime. Um, but again, uh, talking about the area uh, a few hundred years ago when, so to speak, capitalism developed, it, it's certainly clear that there was more of an, uh, as Murray Rothbard would say, life-affirming attitude among the Catholics um, than there was among uh, the Protestants uh, who, for whom life was something uh, less than enjoyable, to put it, uh, to put it mildly. Um, in fact, what? Catholics have more fun. Ca Catholics have, I, as I said, in the 20th century, I'm not sure if that applies anymore. <laughs> it seems to become, everybody has fun all the time, I guess. <laughs> I, but in the, old, in the old days, I think Catholics definitely had more fun. Um, the, because you could also, your sins could be easily forgiven. Um, whereas, whereas, the, whereas the sins, of course, they stick with the Protestant forever. You, know. you never get rid of it. Um, so, um, in fact, if I'm, if I'm correct, I mean, we have some uh, Catholic experts sitting here, and I hardly dare to look at them. Um, <laughs> it, 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 in fact, for the private property, until 1891 uh, by uh, Leo XIII, uh, when he declared private property to be a good, private property had before been seen by the Catholics uh, as a regrettable, though unavoidable, concession to the weakness of human nature. So that is, they were not opposed to it, uh, but they thought that was somehow had had something to do with with human weakness, and one had regrettably to accept this institution. And only relatively late, with Leo the uh, Thirteenth, is there sort of be a positive affirmation: private property is a good thing. Um, nonetheless, despite this uh, more rationalistic attitude among Catholics as compared to the face, blind face attitude found among Protestants, uh, Weber seems to be fundamentally right in the following way. Um, in mixed populations, um, like in France or Germany, where have large parts of the population are Catholic and large parts are Protestant, in Germany it's almost half, half and half, we do find a significant overrepresentation of Protestants among the capitalists. Um, and in general, we can say 
uh, that of course capitalism um, was further developed uh, and was more successful in northern Europe and also in the United States um, than in southern Europe and of course northern Europe is predominantly uh, Protestant. Um, this cannot be explained with the interest question. Um, that is, Protestants had less difficulties with charging interest than Catholics, but in the Catholic uh, doctrine, uh, the interest prohibition had been by and large undermined completely uh, at the time. So this is likely not the explanation for uh, the greater success of uh, as far as capitalistic development is concerned of uh, Protestant uh, places. Uh, certainly, uh, the doctrine of predestination has nothing to do with the greater success of uh, the Protestant religions. If anything, if people would have taken the doctrine of predestination seriously, they would have fallen into some oriental uh, lethargic uh, uh, fatalism. Um, after all, if it's all predestined, uh, why, why should I do anything? So what we can infer from this is uh, the doctrine of predestination, while it existed on the books, so to speak, was never really taken seriously by anybody. Um, what likely is the explanation for uh, the greater amount of capital accumulation and success and so forth of the Protestant religion is simply um, the, their puritanical outlook, which involves you work without enjoyment. Um, uh, work is the only way to riches. Um, the riches, the wealth that you accumulate are an indicator of grace. Um, work is for Protestants almost like prayer. Um, there's a certain amount of asceticism um, that Protestants uh, accept. Uh, you don't enjoy life. You just pain yourself, work harder and harder. Um, there is among the Protestants a more pronounced rejection of ostentatious consumption um, and of an ostentatious display of wealth. Um, again, you can see that even now, that rich people in places like Italy or Spain live in places that look like rich people live there. Um, I know many rich people in Germany that live in places they look no different from the place where I live in. Um, there is uh, uh, a rejection of course of gambling among, um, uh, among the Puritans and drinking and all the rest of it. Um, all of this, let me conclude with this, all of this that we might regard as an achievement of the puritanical religions, uh, Lutheranism and Calvinism, however, it might be regarded as some sort of mixed blessing. Um, because what was truly unique in the Western world and what might have had a far greater impact on the ultimate superiority of the Western civilization as compared to others than the Christian religion itself uh, is the fact that only in Europe uh, was the power of the church and the power of the earthly rulers uh, institutionally separated. Um, 
you had the Pope in, in Rome being, so to speak, an international church, uh, counterbalancing the power of the various local, the various local lords. Um, uh, reducing, so to speak, the power of these lords um, because uh, they did not control the church at the same time. But this separation of church and state, which was unique for Europe, that existed in no other part of the world, this unique separation was, of course, to a large extent, if not completely, uh, broken up, abolished, precisely through the Protestant Revolution. Um, that is, by breaking up the international Catholic Church and uh, founding various national churches, Lutherans, Calvinists, and whatever, and, Mr. Knox in Scotland and so forth, um, all of a sudden the princely rulers, of course, uh, realized that this gives the possibility for me to combine um, the highest rank in the worldly hierarchy as king or prince um, with the highest rank also in the church. Um, and in so far, and this is, so to speak, the, mi mixed, the mixed blessing, um, uh, Protestantism um, has systematically strengthened uh, the power of the state. Um, and Protestantism has also been responsible uh, to a large extent for the promotion of democratic values. Remember, I explained in the Catholic Church you have hierarchies. The Catholic Church is anti-democratic. Um, the Protestant churches are far more democratic. The high churches, the high Protestant churches, have gone back to a certain extent in the direction of the Catholic Church because they were aware of the dangers that result if you let every individual, so to speak, interpret the Bible on its own. If you do that, and if you have a document that is not internally consistent, then of course you get a splitting off of all sorts of weird sects. This is of course precisely what one of the side effects of the Protestant Revolution was, that you had a multiplication of weird people, of weird things happening all of a sudden. Which happens, of course, if every individual just interprets whatever he thinks is right and nothing is filtered through some people who have more wisdom than others. And of course, the Lutheran Church, which was initially quite democratic, has abolished this, has also built up hierarchies, not to the same extent as the Catholic Church, and so has, of course, the Anglican Church. Um, and if you look at the present situation, it's like, the craziest churches are, of course, the churches that are most democratic up to this point. And with this, I'll end my lecture. And I think I have already used up all of my time. We will just have to talk about this at, at the next lecture or uh, uh, next break or so. Thank Great you. Time.